Hello, Pod Smashers of the Internet, and welcome to another episode of A Deep Bit Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. That's right, and tonight we are going to do our last episode of 2020, finishing, not finishing, but continuing on with our series on the Wikipedia's list of best video games of all time, which ter- or Penguin thought would be a one-parter and turned into, so far, four parts. Probably be like <laughs> ten parts by the time we're done here, but it took us longer to get through this list than we thought it would because we did kind of want to somewhat talk about each entry as much as was reasonable, but the definition of reasonable for each individual entry begins to blur depending on how much we love any individual title. (laughs) So we are going to keep going with that. So this tonight we are going to hopefully get through at least the year 2001 and talk about definitely the year 2000 for sure. And 2001 is a big year, so uh, it might take us a while to get through both of those years similar to our last episode where we did 1998 and 1999 it took us a whole episode just for those two years so this may be another two year but hopefully the ones after that aren't nearly as bad so we'll be able to hit more titles in future episodes anyways uh without for well we will get to all of that in the meat of our episode but in the meantime we are where gaming goes to grab a beer so what are you drinking I am drinking one of those legendary beers from all around the world that you keep claiming that I have. A beer from a brewery named Blue Jacket. This is a beer called Caribou. And I have to thank friend of the show, Sean, once again, for providing this. But it is a brewery in Washington, D.C. And Caribou. Sweet stout with peanut butter, natural flavor, Mm. vanilla beans, and cocoa nibs. Alcohol is 9% by volume and contains lactose. This beer tastes like a milkshake. A peanut butter, (laughs) coffee, chocolate, milkshake. How does it compare to like a Sweet Baby Jesus? Oh, Sweet Baby Jesus is absolute trash and garbage (laughs) compared to this beer. Okay. I can't stand the beer, Sweet Baby Jesus. Like, it is not good. (laughs) I took a sip of that. You didn't want to just say the words, I can't stand Sweet Baby Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, I had, to, I had to preface the beer, right? Yeah, I'm glad you caught that. It's funny. That was pretty funny. That was yep. good. Mm. But yeah, milk stout makes it really thick. I like a milkshake, full-bodied. It gives you that creaminess that lactose beers give you. It has the stout notes of coffee and kind of like mushroom, soily back taste that you get from stout, stouts. But also with the peanut butter and the vanilla and the cocoa nibs, you get all dessert on the on the front, front and center, and it is awesome. I highly recommend it. If you want to go to Blue Jacket and you're in the D.C. area, Go pick it up. Awesome. I treated myself to one of my favorite beers, one of my favorite stouts. It is stout season hardcore now, and I uh, I wanted to get one, even though I was torn because it was another beer that I had never tried before, and I was like, do I want that? But no, I wanted to treat myself to a four-pack of Goodwood Bourbon Barrel Stout. Ooh. Stout aged in a bourbon barrel, touched by wood, brewed with limestone water. 8% alcohol by volume. This is an awesome beer. I love it. I love it so much. Big fan of stouts and especially bourbon barrel, bourbon aged, anything really. <laughs> I like bourbon. I don't know if I've ever had this. You've had a good one? I had to look it up. I don't think so. Mm. Like the, it's not one of the staples that are around. Like you get like Founders, Kentucky Bourbon mm-hmm. Stout, KBS, and you get Dark Hollow and you get... It reminds me of Dark um, Hollow what is, is, is what this... this beer reminds me of i have first had it when i worked at capital ale house and ah ah uh, yeah i'm surprised you haven't had good wood before you might have to yeah i never one of mine i mean yep. it's it's a it's a bourbon barrel stout like it's not it's not anything special beyond that like it's not any necessarily better or worse than like a dark hollow is but it's just a solid bourbon barrel stout that you can get in cans in the grocery store so <laughs> nice yeah, I see the cans on the internet here. But yeah, you have like your gingerbread stouts and your Goose Island Bourbon County and all those other standards. I never heard of Goodwood, mm. so that's cool. Good wood. They have a stout barrel finished Kentucky straight bourbon. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Fantastic. That's, just, that's on Google. That, that'd be that sweet. Would be I would awesome, love to yeah. try a stout stout barrel bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> stout barrel bourbon. Well, <laughs> saying it yep. backwards. 
All right. Well, this section normally would be filled up by news in the past, but we are done with that. We're done with that noise because we are now doing news in a weekly live Twitch show that is more recent, more uncut, more unfiltered, and up to date. So it's a 30-minute show once every week on Mondays. So the same day as this episode drops, there will be an episode of that at 8 o'clock going over the week's video game news and uh, that leaves us with more time in this show to talk about other stuff. So is there anything you wanted to talk about today with our time? We made it. We have made it. We have turned the corner. <laughs> New Year's Day is, what, four days from the airing uh-huh. of this episode? One, two, three, four. Yep, today is Monday. New Year's Day 2021 is Friday. The end of this apocalyptic, abysmal decade of a year is now coming to a close and we are all here to talk about our favorite thing, funny video because, games and drink really good beer. Yeah, it's not yet for us. Like we still have to get through Christmas and New Year's from when we're recording this episode. It's still a few weeks away. But yes, for the intents and purposes of being current to our listeners who are listening to this at the time they're listening to it, it's almost over. You're almost there. <laughs> the finish line so is close. right there. Don't collapse yet. Limp across the finish line if you have to, but there's no guarantee 2021 will be any better. So just well, there's a new administration and there's a vaccine. So, you know, that's true. At least it's not par for the course, right? right? Something will change. Something is going to change, whether to your liking or not. Change. Yes, it will be different. uh, But uh, yeah, don't uh, we all have agreed that no one no one says 2021 is going to be their year because people said that with 2020 and look how it turned out. (laughs) So no jinxing it. Everyone just kind of keep their mouths shut. Keep your heads down and let's barrel through. Let's get through this next year. Uh, Maybe 2022 can be your year. (laughs) Yeah. And ironic, like you just said it earlier, how we're we're going through the video games of the the best video games of all time. And we're now in the 2000s. It's 20 years ago. We're going to be talking about our favorite experiences from 20 years ago. And I remember them. Like, can you, like, it's crazy. It's just, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel old, but I feel like, experienced or present like i've lived you know yeah we're talking about cool things 20 years ago it's awesome Mm -hmm. all right well let's do for our next segment (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) nothing else you want to add huh no uh our next segment is doing this podcast is our favorite thing doing this podcast is our favorite thing favorite things a segment of our show where we're talking about the thing that we dig this week Something could be small or big, deep or shallow, meaningful or not. So, something cool. Yeah. What's your favorite thing? My favorite thing. What was, has been my favorite thing this week? I got a sound bar for Christmas from my parents and I set it all up and it is, it has two surround sound speakers, which is an upgrade from the previous soundbar i had which was built into my tv Mm -hmm. i loved that soundbar and my old tv but the new tv didn't have anything but its terrible speakers and so my parents said why don't we get you a soundbar that's a great idea because that's expensive kind of and i don't want to have to worry about it so uh i love it it is awesome and because it's an upgrade from the previous situation that i had i find myself wanting to play You know, I talked at length on this show about how amazing it is to jump from 1080p to 4K and have that experience. And I want to revisit all the last three years of gaming on the PS4 Pro with the 4K TV now on a PS5. And now I want to continue to play games and re-experience the sound that they provided Mm -hmm. with with a full, it has a subwoofer and a giant center channel, of course, because it's a bar and then it has the surround sound ones. I ordered some speaker stands and I haven't wired them up yet, but I will. And yeah, I'm excited. Like, it sounds really cool. Sometimes I, I game with a headset on because yeah. the headset sounds better. But now I and the kids being asleep and stuff. But depending on the situation, like today I played Animal Crossing with my son. It's all snowy. It's amazing. And by the time you're listening to this, the toy day has already happened. But I loved it. And I was able to turn the sound up and enjoy the, the songs of that game because I love I love the songs of Animal Crossing. Mm-hmm. But that's my favorite thing Wait. is a sound bar. Awesome. My favorite thing. Whoa, it's hard to pick. Like it's one of those weeks where it's hard to kind of pick one single one. Not because there were so many good things, but because it was just kind of like a lot of pretty medium things. But um, I did take a four day weekend and that was nice. And just for no reason in particular, just to kind of like a mental health weekend. My buddy Justin came up on Saturday for the day 
and that was awesome. So getting to kind of hang out with him and have a bit of a Christmas with him because, you know, normally I'd be making a trip down to Bridgewater to Harrisonburg for to spend time with my family around Christmas, but that's not really happening this year. So we made time to see each other since I wouldn't be making my way that way. This shout out yeah. Justin is the same person who gave me about Vocabo yeah. and Amiibo to finish my Legend of Zelda Amiibo. He's a good dude. So this is the same yep. Justin. Yep, it's awesome. good dude. So that was awesome. Just being able to see him hang out. We got Poco Loco. So again, lots of like cool upper medium like good things this weekend for me. So um, and then today was my last my last day of my little uh long weekend. I'm taking another long weekend next weekend though, which is exciting, but not like a four day, just a three day weekend. So um, nice. just to just to kind of burn up a little bit of PTO before the end of the year. Not that I like need to. I'm not losing it. Not saying you lose any, but you know, it's the end of the year. Like, oh, I want to take it easy. <laughs> it's holidays. Yep. So cool. Uh, that's about it for me. Then favorite things. So normally we would be going right into DLC, but since this is this our tradition with the Wikipedia is to try to make as much time for talking about these games as possible and it is kind of like one big dlc we're gonna skip dlc i know it's the second week in a row so apologies even though last week's episode was a more was like a longer version of a more traditional dlc we're yeah we're not skipping right, dlc we're, doing, we're expanding we're dlc one. to take over the whole yeah, show exactly. we're skipping our yeah topic, exactly is what fair, we're enough, doing. fair enough so the second week we're doing this in a row that's cool it's fine um we're just uh killing time in a lot of ways before the uh end of the year so it should be fun, though. It's uh, it's a fun discussion. I always have fun with these. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and do the DLC sounds, though, because we know how much you love it. Ming, 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 DLC. <laughs> All right. I just train wreck. I just bulldozed you as soon as you said, we're still going to do the sound. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> All right, then let's jump into it real quick. As a, I totally forgot to sort of preface this with what this is. So if you're just jumping in, and this is your first episode, or or this is your first time hearing one of these episodes. If you're a recent listener, we have last time we did one of these, like the weather was warm. So the idea it was September. Yeah, the idea behind this is there is a list uh, on Wikipedia of the games that are widely considered the best games of all time, and the methodology they use to compile this list is they scoured tons of different different publications for their various lists of best video games of all time. And if a game showed up on that list, what is it, more than six times, I think it is, then uh, it made it on this list. So it's not just a complete made up list. It's not just someone going in and typing in their favorite games list like this is a fairly heavily curated list based on um, various criteria. So with that in mind, it is not again, it is not our list. It is not something that we came up with. So we are discussing with each game what whether we think that it should be on the list of best video games of all time so uh and then we will also talk obviously the ones that we agree with we we might talk more than we should about so uh, any other thoughts on that we'll kind of go over overall trends of the years that we cover um again this is going to be chronological because that's how the list is structured but we're not like talking about the years necessarily we're talking about these games on this list and their place and then we'll talk about trends though we'll talk about like we'll kind of break it down later and be like, yeah, the year 2000 saw this. It's not surprising that this kind of game uh, showed up on the list, or it is surprising. This kind of game showed up on the list. So any other thoughts? We may not have the encyclopedic knowledge of every single video game. And when it was released to know what games are lacking from this list. So if there is a glaring omission, it's not our fault. Again, this is a curated list. We're not here to add things to the list or take away from. We're simply running through it. So if your favorite game you know came out in the year 2000 and we don't hit it, it, sorry, it just didn't make the list. And that's not what this show is. But as for every single game on the list, we want to look at things just to get your grid set up. We want to look at what did the game offer the industry or culture at large, if it did at all. Uh, what kind of how did it bring games forward as an art form or entertainment medium? And then should it be on the list? Of course, we talked about that. So that's kind of what we're going through as we hit each title. Um, and we're we will go fast and slow based on our experience with it and what we know about it. So if it's a game we don't know and we haven't played it, we don't really know how it impacted anything. Then we'll probably just breeze through it. Sorry. <laughs> that's yep. yep. That's who yep. we are. We're here. And uh, hopefully we'll get through two years at least. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so, all right, cool. Then, like I said, last time we talked about System Shock and Unreal as our last one is from 99. So let's start the year 2000 with Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Um, made by Black Isle Studios, which was former, which is the former name of what is currently Obsidian Entertainment. So we mm-hmm. did talk about this game, I believe. 
in um that episode where we talked about them as developer profile. So we did. Baldur's Gate continues to be, you know, the deep Dungeons and Dragons kind of based action mm-hmm. role uh, role playing game, isometric, isometric top yep. down. It looks 3D, but it's not. Uh, you have a party system, dialogue choices. It's pretty much like the grandfather of what we would see today. It's like we're playing cyberpunk, mm-hmm. and there's dialogue choices. Yep. Diablo, you know, kind of you know RPG. It's it's what it is. It's PC RPG. Uh, there's a port of these games, the Baldur's Gate games, on modern consoles. I think you can get mm-hmm. it. And, and this is the uh, last one. I mean, this is dialogue heavy. 20 years later, we would get Baldur's Gate, or I guess 19 years later, because I think it came out in 2019, but Baldur's Gate 3 just came out, like, very recently. So this is yep. the first, this is the first, uh, or yeah, this this was the last one of these we got for a while. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it just goes, again, the fact that they're, like, making a new one, and it's big news, I would say, yeah, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 should be on this list. Is Baldur's Gate, was Baldur's Gate on there, the first one? So. It was. We talked about one of the uh, like Swindale, I think, was on yep. there. That's one of the other. Oop. Yeah, maybe Planet Side mm-hmm. or whatever it's called. Plantscape. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Plantscape also made same company. But yep. So it's that's more of that. that I guess it hit two thousands. We I never played Neither it. So I. yeah. So yep. All right. Well, this one is one next that you game. have played. I'm gonna talk yeah, about the next one. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, I am chomping. It's a bit to talk, talk about. about. The next game on this list is Counter Strike. It is a mod to Half-Life, but it is a first-person studio-developed mod, so it's by Valve. It's not a community-based mod. Counter-Strike. So the I played the, the mess out of Counter-Strike. It was earth-shattering, groundbreaking for multiplayer arena-type games. It moved the genre away from what Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament were doing, which were fast-paced arcade games like rocket launchers and crazy levels, and brought us to a tactical, more realistic Yeah, you shooter. basically die if you get would, shot once, right? Like, that's kind of the... That's what I always remembered about If you get a headshot once, yeah. you're done. Like, headshots kill instantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can only take, like, two or three yep. hits, Not, but you can get body armor, which may add one more hit, yeah. depending on where you're hit on the body. And then you had, like money at the beginning of each round and you start off poor and you can only afford like a pistol or maybe a, a cheap submachine gun and then you can run forward and as you get kills you get more money so when you respawn you can then get bigger weapons all the way up to like sniper mm-hmm. rifles which were the most expensive and then they had i don't remember the mode names anymore it's been so long but you could set a bomb so there's there's not it's not capture the flag but like the counter terrorists and the terrorists and so the terrorists goal was to go into where the counter terrorists were and plant a bomb at a designated site so a and b uh and then set the bomb has a countdown timer but it also took time to plant it so you had to hold the button defenseless and wait so it was very tactical very team-based arena shooter this is the grandfather of what we see as like apex legends um mm-hmm. oh yeah i would even say for fortnite and, and overwatch i mean just as well, much valorant. as the tournament and quake valorant, 3 were the, valorant the, that yes that's the most modern that's, yeah because it's, you. It, it is like a mix between overwatch with the character abilities and the, and the and the stuff like that but it's a tactical shooter of the same vein as counter-strike is what people um, yep. often talk about so yeah no it was definitely a big deal again it, it stands not only does it stand as a historical example of like a pra- practically a genre of its own but it also was so counter to the first person shooters of its time that were much more, like yep. you said, arcadey, more like, you know, not not to say more strategic, but more like fanciful in regards to how many shots a human being can take before they die. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, whereas Counter-Strike was like, no, like this is this is basically like SWAT tactics, uh, a SWAT tactic simulator. So they're trying to be as true to reality as, as was the technology allowed at the time. So yeah, big. And there were there were other games out there at the time that were even more realistic. But what Counter Strike did so well was strike that balance. Yes, strike pun intended. Yep. The balance of playability, bridge to learn, like fun to play, fun to learn, ridiculously hard to master. Yeah. Uh, whereas the more realistic stuff that we see now in like Arma Three, that that are just hyper realistic, those aren't as approachable and and not. You know, they don't have mass appeal mm-hmm. like Counter Strike did. Counter Strike was what Call of Duty is today, then at the time. So uh, it was it's just awesome. I yeah. can't praise Counter Strike enough. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, Monumental. here's a game that I can praise highly for the next one. Um, again, the, it's it's worth noting that the last again in the last episode we talked about a massive amount of PC games. Like there's like this list is broken. If you're looking at like the platform, it's like PC for like 10 games broken up only by Shenmue being a Dreamcast game. Yep. So uh, again, we'll talk about trends in a bit, but like it just continues that PC dominance of this era. Diablo two is the next one on the list. And my, Oh, you skipped one. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Crap. 
Deus Ex is the next one on the list. <laughs> you I were so excited. I that, can't yeah. wax eloquent about Deus Ex. I can say, though, Deus Ex is the fur. Well, maybe not the first, but um, Deus Ex is is really, I would say, arguably a grandfather of what we're seeing now with cyberpunk. It is a yep. definitely a cyberpunk genre game. If you look at the, the Wikipedia description set in a cyberpunk themed world, but it has. It was the game that was yeah. that was exploring the ideas of people replacing body parts with cybernetic implants and the idea of cyborgs and androids and all that stuff. AI that nano is, machines. Yep. There's a uh, Deus Ex. Beyond that, I don't know much about this game. I have the newest one, whatever it's called. Mankind divided. Is that what it's called? Deus Ex two or I something so. like that. Yeah, It was free on PlayStation. Yep, exactly. I haven't. I've always been meaning to play it because I've heard they're, they're challenging games. They're not like souls. They're not souls games at all. Like souls like, but they're, I've always heard that they're first first person shooters. They're challenging games. So I don't know. I want to mm-hmm. want to try it. Yeah, they're first person shooters. They're a little bit more precise mm-hmm. than Unreal or Doom. Yeah, you know, it's a little slower paced, has more dialogue and RPG elements. Yep, more RPG the skill points exist. Mm-hmm. Weapon modifications, scope, silencers, laser sights, etc. Eh, I haven't played it either, mm-hmm. but it looks good. Yep. All right, now we can talk about now Diablo you can talk 2. About Diablo 2. <laughs> Diablo 2, uh, I mean, it, it it really was just Diablo 1, but bigger in a lot of ways. Like, bigger, higher stakes story, more, you know, they introduced the idea of the prime evils, that, that Diablo, this evil demon that you encountered in the first game, that he had brothers. So you had to fight the brothers, you basically got to fight all the brothers. And uh, so bigger story, more cl- character classes. The first game just had... You know, the archer, the wizard, and the warrior. Um, so they had four classes, and then they added two more in the DLC, the expansions, I guess, at the time. And uh, yeah, I mean, just the, they, they continued to push the mechanics of what a isometric RPG was capable. But the big innovation here, the big thing that set Diablo 2 apart from its predecessor was they leveraged their Battle.net servers that they had been running StarCraft and Warcraft on to add a multiplayer aspect to Diablo 2. And this multiplayer yeah. aspect blew up. I mean, again, they created an incredibly deep gearing system. And that gearing system, coupled with a loot grind. Again, this is what started the idea of... I mean, this game pretty much started the idea of grinding loot. And then oh, yeah. showing it off, right? Like, <laughs> showing it mm-hmm. off to people in multiplayer. Um, whether it was fighting them in PvP or just trading them and showing how much value you had. And things, again, the game created its own soft currency with... Stones of Jordan. We talked all about that in our episode on yep. currency. Like this game just <laughs> had a robust and thriving multiplayer and a robust and thriving proto economy on uh, on this on um, yeah on a Diablo on top down isometric RPG RPG. Fantastic, just crazy what it added to video gaming. So yes, totally deserves to be. Arguably, I think Diablo two deserves to be on there more than Diablo. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Diablo two was awesome. It had that same balance of complexity uh, rpg elements where you're developing a class Mm -hmm. of a character that has like an optimized build when you want to spend points in specific stuff that matches specific gear and you want to grind that gear to get it but they made that approachable and they made it fun Mm -hmm. and they made it like the barrier of entry was way low and online so you can play with your friends Mm -hmm. and easy to to super common to have like 20 characters and like they're all built differently mules always had mule characters too yeah then they introduced the idea of seasons where like your characters would get deleted after having them for years and so all those yeah, it was nuts just great just crazy game though mm-hmm. this is foundational to me i mean this is what i would probably would never have played well maybe not. i can't say probably but like my motivation to play wow was found like this game was the foundation oh absolutely this was my this is yeah. my int- entry drug as far as like yep. multiplayer rpgs go so cool all right moving on we can talk about i think we we talked about this in our episode on the dreamcast jet set radio mm-hmm. so glad to see it on this list a lot of more dreamcast representation during this era but yeah. I never played this game, so I can't really say much about it. So I'll let you take over. <laughs> I never really played it either. I just know that you are a um, rollerblader in a cell shaded world and your tasks to like spray paint areas. Uh-huh. It's very stylistic. It's very like that teenage, colorful, rebellious nature sort of vibe and fast paced gameplay, arcadey feel. And that's about all I know. <laughs> yeah with jet set radio because i've seen it i've heard about it i know about it but i've never actually sat and played it i yet. like this it's got so a it's anything uh, else it showed up on a list of 100 1001 video games you must play before you die 
Um, but it looks like, uh, you know what it reminds me of just looking at it? It's got that stylized and cartoony, you know, uh, look that I associate with a, a modern, a more modern game, Sunset Overdrive. So I fully yep. believe this was a, a foundational inspiration for that game as well. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, people talk about it all the time. I've always heard about Jet Set Radio. Never played it. Never had a Dreamcast. But yeah, I believe it was it was foundational. Mm-hmm. This year is just full of heavy hitters because the next one on the list is one that we have waxed. This this game showed up <laughs> in our episode, very first episode on uh, as an example of what we consider video games as art because of what this game the layers of meaning and depth in this game. We are, of course, talking about The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask by Nintendo for the N64. It came out in the year 2000 as a... It was made by with the same engine as Ocarina of Time, but added totally new elements and told a completely revolutionary story for a Zelda game. And if you don't stop me now, I'm going to go off on an entire episode tangent about this game. So, um, <laughs> you take over from here. Yeah, yeah. Majora's Mask completely changed the gameplay paradigm of what we would expect from a Legend of Zelda game, which had been previously set up. This is the fifth Zelda mainline game, and the first f- four were all about going to a dungeon, getting a specific weapon, using that weapon to defeat the boss, using that weapon to unlock something in the overworld, and then go to the next dungeon and r- rinse and repeat. And not just that, but the Where story Mask- was very paint-by-numbers. Princess Zelda, Triforce, Master Sword, Ganon, <laughs> for the most part. Not, right. Obviously, there were some slight differences between the games. But for the most part, that's what you were dealing with in pretty much every Zelda game up to this point. This game blew up that paradigm entirely. And it was like, yeah, this takes place after Ganon is done and gone. Uh, and Link's going on his own little adventure in a like parallel universe. And the bad guy is the Skull Kid with a demon mask. And the moon's going to crash down and nothing about Ganon, no Master Sword, none of that. No Princess Zelda, even like the fact that this game is named after Zelda. She has no place in this story. <laughs> she has no she doesn't even yeah. show up. She shows up in a cinematic at the yep. very beginning to kind of transition to. But then it's just Link all the way. So crazy, crazy paradigm shifting game. And yeah, I would say li- very much laid the groundwork for what we would see. The experimentation that we would see from this franchise in the future. Um, because of how well this was received so had a whole mechanic about and, like putting on a mask and having different effects there was an incredibly robust side quest you know content in this game so much more than previous Zelda titles um, and then beyond that it has tells things this- that we would see like in modern mm-hmm. um, boulder not boulder skate uh, modern elder scrolls yeah. games mm-hmm. or like big fallout stuff where you have timelines and things happen in the world whether you're there or not and the the big giant side quest you're referring to is like you have to collect all these masks from these various people, but you have to follow them around and learn their behaviors uh-huh, in order yeah. to figure out where to be and who to talk to at a certain time. And it was crazy because this game's all about time travel and reliving the same three days yep. over and over again. Yep. Which is a with mechanic a subset that of is, items that carry forward. Like that's a, that was a mechanic way before its time as well. Like, and I remember people being really confused by it. Like, what are you making us? Like, you're making us. I remember reading about it in like Nintendo Power and stuff like that, and people were all like, I don't know how to feel about this but then it worked it worked so well that like t- t- almost 20 years later 15 20 years later you'd see people like emulating it in completely new experiences like outer wilds returnals coming out that's foundation you know roguelikes and all that stuff were really basically picking up the torch on this <laughs> very odd yep. strange thing so anyways that's probably all that needs to be said it was just incredible game <laughs> definitely needs to be on this yep. list uh it would show up probably on our the, list if we made one of our it own. would be our list if we had to take everything that came out in 2000 and take this list of best games in the year 2000 and rank them this would be number this one is it. yeah mm-hmm. oh yeah this is yeah if, best game if we had to if we had to like take all of these years and just isolate it down to a single title then this would probably be that for this year yeah agreed so yep cool mm um follow the follow-up to that how do you follow up legend of zelda majora's mask the next one on the list is the sims yes the sims and talk like in this genre the sims did to life simulation as like what we've been talking about that ever so what counter-strike did to first person shooters what diablo did to isometric rpgs what legend of zelda majora's mask did for that that franchise the sims did the same thing like oh, this yeah. is a great year totally. the year 2000 yeah. the sims was life simulation where you create like these this family or i guess a collection of sims like these individuals and they live together and they have chores and they have jobs and they have incomes and there's all this it's kind of like sim city but instead of managing a city you're managing people and you can have your own like family unit and so they had these quests where you would i i was ridiculously addicted to the sims when Mm -hmm. it first came out the first one was amazing for what it was because we'd never seen anything really like this before where you have 
whatever family structure you want to come up with, kids and all, you can have that needed to provide income and needed to have relationships and you had to manage all those things and day by day down to like your house could catch on fire and your toilet can overflow and the sink can spill over into the floor and like there's happiness ratings and you had to manage all these people uh, and then achieve different goals. And, but you could also have the deep customization systems to create your own house, to like create your looks, to, to do the things that you want to do, like different jobs for each of your Sims. So you can totally create your own whatever you want. And yeah. You can be like in a mansion, you can be in a castle, you can be in like the slums, like however you want to do it, you can create your own world. And it yeah, hits on this, those notes that we've seen. I see this um, game as being like, like Minecraft a, and stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, I see it being in yeah. a lot of ways a predecessor to things like like Second Life as well, where this is the kind yep. of game that appeals to people that aren't just gamers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, it was, it, I mean, still to this day, Sims games sell very well for people outside of, you know, video gaming scenes. So um, I definitely mm-hmm. will not deny its impact. Not a huge fan of it myself. I just, I mean, this game came out right around the time where my hormones are going crazy. So me and my friends just tried to figure out a way to like see the naked people beyond this, like the blurry sensor <laughs> chip. <laughs> and that's like, literally, I remember like 90% of my experience with the Sims was just that. So, <laughs> Oh man. Could you imagine if cyberpunk came out when you were that oh, age? Oh man. It would have been, I, yeah, no, it would have been, <laughs> been, I had my first moment with my wife paper when she came down. I was been. like, I was playing PlayStation five remote play and I was like, don't turn on the TV because the kids are out there. Don't turn on the TV at all. And she's like, Oh, okay. (laughs) But anyway, yeah, the Sims kind of had the same thing, right? You could woohoo. That's what they called it. Mm -hmm. It was woohoo. And you could get two Sims to fall in love and you could put them in the same room and they would woohoo and create a baby. And yep, that's where I'll leave that because we are going to say for a 10 year old in the year 2000, that was, um, Led to some dark, dark thoughts. Anyways, moving along. Yep. Uh, the next game on the list, The Thief Thief 2, The Metal Age. Talked a little bit about Thief 1 in the last episode because it was a 98. It was also, it was a it was a game on this list in 98. Mm-hmm. So the follow-up to it, don't really, again, don't really know much about this myself. It was, again, another predecessor of the stealth video game genre. And uh, all the, mm-hmm. you know, when I was reading about it in uh, in its actual Wikipedia page, it was reviewed as being kind of more bigger, better of the same thing. So yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Just like the grandfather of what we see as dishonored today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, First person. It's what stealth. that was. Yep. Yep. Exactly. You're a thief. You have bone arrow, you mm-hmm. pickpocket. So elements that you would, that have been peaked, picked apart by more modern experiences. This is kind of the, mm-hmm. the grandfather of that. For sure. Good yeah. stuff. I like the thief series. Yep. Next game on the list we talked about recently in our sports episode, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Oh my gosh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, so addicting. Yeah, so it's the, so fun. Pro Skater 1 is not on this list, so that means this one was it's the not. one that stood out. So uh, Pro yep. Skater 2, what, what makes Pro Skater 2 the best video game of all time that Pro Skater 1 is not? Pro Skater 1 was a little bit more limited. What Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 would expand the levels, make them crazier, make them mm-hmm. more fun, expand the skater custom customization, like the skateboards and more skaters to choose from, uh, more tricks. And I don't know what trick was introduced. Each each Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, at least the first four, introduced some new mechanic mm-hmm. that enhanced like the tricks. And I don't remember what two did. I just played, I think two was the first one I ever played, actually. Yeah. So I don't really have the one and two comparison. I think so but too. I think yeah. It was just like this. And two is on super arcade. So like, what you would n- did they port it eventually, like GameCube or something? Because I feel like I played it on GameCube. Pro Skater Two was on Dreamcast. It was on PlayStation. It was on N sixty four. Okay, Game Boy so Color. I, on S4 I mean, then. yeah, yeah. So it, it never went outside. So PlayStation, N sixty four, Dreamcast cool. were the three home consoles yeah, that it was on. It. The sequel. There was later like a an HD version on Xbox, but that's beside the point. So what Tony Hawk's Pro Skater did to the skating game is what NBA jam and NFL blitz and those midway arcade games did to other, their genres. So Mm -hmm. what NBA jam is basketball, it's two on two and you can set the the rim on fire. It's crazy turbo mode. You get, it's like arcadey and fun and fast paced. And then NFL blitz, same thing. You can throw the football. It's like, nuts, crazy wrestling moves, tackling each other, going crazy on football. And then Tony Hawk's pro skater is kind of that vibe. It's that like arcade fast paced, easy to learn, hard to master trick system where you can grind on rails and jump up crazy ramps and, and destroy an entire city and like 
ransack. It's basically like what skaters were. They were super rebellious. Yeah. They were out mm-hmm. in the streets skating and interrupting people's lives and frustrating people. And they thought it was hilarious. That whole culture that was like Bam Margera, Jackass, mm-hmm. like on MTV was all kind of encapsulated in this gem of a video game that felt so good to play right. that rightfully represented the culture, the music, the soundtrack to this is, I still listen to it to this day on Spotify. It is that <laughs> punk rock offspring, Blink-182, Green Day, like soundtrack that's just awesome. Yeah, this uh, is the they, uh, they, second they time. Like, yeah, this is the second time. This is the, only the second Activision game that has showed up on this list since Pitfall. And I think it's notable that this is the this is not only the second Activision game, but the first Activision sports game. So I would argue that this game solidified Activision's reputation as a sports game developer. It was done on the backs of Neversoft Entertainment. They were the developers. Yeah. But yes, Activision oh, being sure. known as a publisher, but never saw the developer, which doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, they did some other things. I believe they were involved in like the NBA street series uh, and some other things, but they just did this. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. And at some point like mm-hmm. EA was involved in the, the, I don't know, but yeah, Tony Hawk's pro skater, fantastic skating game for sure. And cemented the skating genre and just really captured that culture mm-hmm. so well. Yep. All right, we are done with the year 2000, so 2001 is a huge year, arguably the biggest year on this list, um, so hopefully we can knock it out, and maybe, just maybe, we can, like squeeze out 2002 on there as well. But That's nah, uh, probably not going to happen. <laughs> probably not. No. But, uh, 2001 is it. There's a lot to say about these games. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's start then. So, uh, yeah, I, I look off the bat, I look at the first three, and I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, yep, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, we're going to start with two huge Nintendo games. And the first one we'll talk about for the year 2001 is Advance Wars turn-based tactics. Did you play this strategy game? I did not. And it I won't say that it um, I won't say that I ever got confused between this game and Ta- Final Fantasy Tactics because they are very different games. And I recognize that. But I kind of lumped them in the same category of game that as a 11 year old in 2001, I was just like, meh. Whereas I've got friends who played them and love them. So, but this is, yeah, this is, this is the first, as far as I know, this is the first like quote tactical RPG that I think showed up on this list, right? No, Final Fantasy um, Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics was on yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, sorry. But the mm-hmm. uh, second one. So this is just to go to show that this, it didn't just live and die with Final Fantasy Tactics, this genre. Um, Nintendo took a crack at it themselves. Yeah. So it's in the same vein. You should confuse this with Fire Emblem before you would Final Fantasy Tactics. <laughs> Fair enough. Because it's very much like Fire Emblem, but also it's a grid-based combat system, moving your units around, different types of units, fire, rock, paper, scissors, kind of cons, pros and cons, etc. It's tactical, it's strategy. Oh, it's made by the same cool story sub-developer it's as Fire Emblem. Intelligent, intelligent systems. systems. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, Nintendo Game Boy Advance. So mm-hmm. it's worth noting that this was a portable game, and so it was a full-fledged tactical-based RPG on a handheld and that's probably why it's on this list is because yeah. it's so good and so polished and it feels awesome to play. Uh, and you and take it's it on anywhere. A <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. You could take it anywhere. Yep. Play it well in the car. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Anything that's else? That's pretty much all I've got to say about that because yeah. I never got to play it. There's mm-hmm. some sequels and spinoffs, but it always really looks good it. for a tactical for a tactical RPG game. And they show up. The yeah. units show up in um, Smash Bros. So they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. It's definitely a staple in Nintendo's history for sure. All right, speaking of staples in Nintendo's history, we can talk about the very first entry in Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing and Oh yeah, my gosh. This game. And we've talked about, talk it about recently on the podcast because oh. of because of the Animal Crossing New Horizons that just came out. But I mean, this game that came out in 2001, I mean, yeah, was a foundational game for a franchise that has solidifies Nintendo's reputation and continues to... I mean, literally, this game moved consoles this year, or the uh, the, uh, the latest it, it, entry in this game. Lots. So, yeah, this was the first. You think about Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask was the foundation of Animal Crossing. It had the living world that existed, whether you played or not, for the first time. Uh, and it had holidays that ha- crept up during real time. So if you look out the window mm. and it's December 24th, it's December 24th in your game and your your neighbors will miss you. There are seasonal events. You can completely customize your home and run around and deck yourself out in whatever clothes you want to do and you can have all of these relationships while collecting fossils, going fishing, collecting fruit, collecting bugs and building up your museum collection but also trying to hit in all of the little special like themed furniture sets like the space furniture set and doing all the conditions you had to do to get those things and it's just like this complete endless churn of fun 
and amazingness that was very difficult to sell and very difficult to understand what it was when it came out. You're talking about reading Nintendo yeah, Powers, yeah. like like Majora's Mask. It's like, what is this? Yeah. We've never had anything like it. It's not The Sims. It's different. But how? And you could have four people exist on one island and it came with a memory card and it took up the entirety of that memory card. So luckily it came with one yeah. and you could have four people live on the same island. So if you had that one memory card in your GameCube, you would have four people that live in your real life house all have an existence in your Animal Crossing world or town, your Animal Crossing town, and they could all affect each other. So you could spend, you know, it's the same gripe you have with New Horizons where it's like there's one primary owner that has all the experiences and then everybody else kind of exists. It was similar to that where there's like four fossils that would show up every day. And if the first person who logged in dug them all up, then that person got them and there's nothing else anybody else could do that kind of like stopped. Yeah, on but each it other. just stuck but on a would... memory card. Memory cards a lot easier to buy another one for than a uh, entire. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can, so you could just buy a new memory card and, and you could have um, a, a whole new town. But what was also cool is you could take that memory card and, share it with your friends. So like you could pass it in school to someone else so that they could log in and like do their things and get their stuff going and their neighbors would learn who they were and you could send gifts and letters to each other within the same town. Of course, now it's expanded to the internet so you can do all that stuff online. But yeah, so animal crossing was just, no one had ever experienced anything like this in 2001. It was entirely groundbreaking. Yep. So that's animal crossing. Crazy. Super fun. Yep. Go check it out. Go, go get it right now. Just go play. (laughs) Nice. Uh, next game on this list is Final Fantasy X. Oh my gosh, I remember this game. This game, for for one, Square, so this is made by Square, Squaresoft, were they called mm-hmm. Squaresoft at the time, or had they changed to Square? They weren't I Square believe Enix it was Squaresoft yet. at the time. Okay. Nope, Squaresoft. So it came out for the PlayStation 2, and this game is known for just pushing that hardware to the limit, and especially in regards to cinematics. Like, Square was always known for their beautiful cinematics with Final Fantasy games, but man, did this game, like, was this game beautiful for its time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just almost like, yeah, a b- beautiful game, but just also yeah. a really good Final Fantasy as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. There was live acted uh, voice dialogue mm-hmm. or voice acted dialogue for every for all the main story beats. That was un- we never seen that before. Yeah. And then the battle system allowed you to trade more than was it three? Do you have three people on the field at one time? You or got four? four. Yeah, so you got four, and you could swap you them out four. in con- like you in the middle of a fight. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and that was totally new. Summons um, were had- you summoned them, and you actually controlled them. Did their moves for a while. That was new at the time too for a Final Fantasy game. Mm-hmm. Instead of just like coming and doing a cinematic, you actually they had moves and a list of their own. It was awesome. This and there's one other title we'll get to later are the two titles that I would say are the epitome of what PlayStation 2 offered, yeah. and that is their hardware and sound and feel and everything else about what PlayStation 2 was as a console. Final Fantasy X embodies part mm-hmm. of that. Yep. I mean, just like the music, the sound, the live active voice acting, it, it, the whole big giant story with the whole religious aspects to it. I think we actually like talked about Final Fantasy X in our Final Fantasy episode and probably in other ones yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. It totally deserves to be on this list for all those reasons mentioned. So there you go. Yeah, so much. Just so many things. Like we could talk about Blitzball. We could talk about summons. We could talk about story. Like it's just, it had it all and it was great. So um, it really just pushed. It's some people's favorite Final mm-hmm. Fantasy of all time. Not ours, but some people's. Yeah. It's, and I've been meaning mm-hmm. to revisit it, honestly, because I, I want to get the remaster or I want to get my hands on even borrowing it. I probably don't want to buy it, but I would like to borrow the remaster and play through it on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Mm-hmm. Cool. Next is a uh, Gran Turismo three. A dash. Oh my god! Never played it, so talk okay. away. So fun thing about Termite, I'm a computer science major. I am a software developer by trade. I am into video games, as I have this podcast that I run, and I like NASCAR. Where in the world does NASCAR fit into any of my life? It, it kind of doesn't. But I can thank Gran Turismo Three A Spec for my extreme fandom in NASCAR, and here's why: the game is so good. It was so realistic at the time. It was the... I remember freaking out over how real the cars looked and felt that I decided I'm going... I was raised in a home that liked to watch NASCAR, but I I was interested in it. So I fired up a NASCAR round in Gran Turismo 3 on a track and got into it. Turned it on full simulation mode. I mean, like, no assists at all. I want a raw experience what the driver would, would feel. And I didn't have a steering wheel or pedals, unfortunately, but I hit the gas and the car just spun out. And I was like, are you serious? Wait, there's got to be more to this than that. Like I'm doing something wrong. And I did. I held the gas too long without shifting. 
So you learn how to shift, you learn the finesse of gas, and you learn how to brake. Then you, I, I kept the car from spinning out, but then I went straight into the wall. And I was like, what in the world's happening? Why can't I turn? Well, there's this lovely little thing called oversteer and understeer where I can get into the techniques of driving and the, the, tech, the terms of all of the deep technical aspects of driving and what they are and learning how to take a turn, apex of a corner, how to, the line to follow, braking zones, all of those things I learned from Gran Turismo 3 because it had it. It was in the game and it was fun and appealing to someone who didn't know driving. There's an entire instruction booklet that came with this that taught you how to drive. There was a, a amazing license training. Uh, they had the like tutorials that were divided into like A, B, C, and S class licenses you could earn by doing all these driving challenges and braking and like speeding up and turning, cornering, all the stuff you would need to learn how to drive and race professionally is in this game. And it was in a video game. Like, and it had real life cars that you could go out in the street and see at a red light out in my house. But then they're in the game and they're represented beautifully and you can customize them with rims and stuff. It was awesome. Like Gran Turismo 3 was just foundational in racing simulation and set my fandom of driving and racing to all degrees. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah, I have nothing else to add there. So we'll go ahead and move on to it sounds like it deserves to be on the list, though. Thanks to your uh, oh, absolutely. Wax, yes. Waxing eloquent. All right, next mm-hmm. on this list would be the game that arguably created the sandbox genre, which would be super popular for the 2000s, and it was, no one's surprised, Grand Theft Auto 3, a Rockstar Games mm-hmm. for the PlayStation 2. Talk about a game that demonstrated what the PlayStation 2 was capable of. Uh, this game, again, the idea of getting into a car and going anywhere and running into any pedestrian you want and suffering the consequences with cops and just going on a complete rampage if you wanted to do it you could do it the game would satisfy that craving and while also simultaneously having a robust story and with a new totally never before seen gameplay mechanics and elements awesome this blew my mind and i i remember playing it for hours and never advancing the story like hours Uh, like days upon days of hours and hours of playing this game and never doing the story i don't think either grand theft auto 3 or vice city i ever did any of the story on i'm pretty sure i just would get into it and just like in vice city it was like try to break into the airport and steal a plane and (laughs) uh, because it was so hard like you couldn't like you're supposed to you weren't supposed to get a plane until like super late in the story but me and my friends were like no we're gonna do it we're gonna like ramp off this mountain and blah 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 it's crazy but yeah both games had that same aspect of like if you want to just get in this game and goof around you can and it's awesome (laughs) it's no it was like the first truly open world experience that i've ever had like before any of those big RPGs no rails, and stuff. No rails and on it blew game. my mind. Yeah. yeah, it like it didn't make sense. It was overwhelming. I wanted a completionist and a collection like hoarder and I wanted to like do everything and you couldn't and it was I didn't know what order to do the quests in and I was confused and I wanted to do everything but I couldn't. And yeah, it's it was awesome. It was a great experience. I want to go back and like actually play through that game because I've never experienced yeah. the story mm-hmm. of Grand Theft Auto 3 or by City either. Yeah. So awesome. Yep. Uh yeah, crazy good. Crazy good games. So all right, next is oh, this year. <laughs> I told you, 2001 is crazy. <laughs> Combat Evolves by Microf- Microfast, Microsoft Game Studios published it, and this was, of course, made by Bungie, the developer, and uh, for a, a debut game for the Xbox, the first Xbox game on this list. Because it was a launch title, as we talked That's because about. Because it was our, a launch title, yeah. In our launch episode, I mean, yeah. Like, what is there to say about Halo? It was. Incredibly compelling story, had good music, incredible score, incredible graphics for the time, solid first-person shooter, advancing first-person shooter mechanics in a way that a game hadn't really done since, like, GoldenEye. And then, yeah, it was, um, well, it wasn't really, it wasn't uh, playable online until Halo 2, but, I mean, it it totally took couch co-op multiplayer to the next level. It was the game everybody talked about, who is the best at Halo. This was the game that, that, you mean, this is... As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the games that was foundational to what we see now with esports because this was the game that everybody wanted to know yep. who was the best at. And I mean, it, for sure, obviously people had been competing in games like Unreal for years on the PC, but this game was the game that was like, this is the console shooter. This is this is what console shooters are capable of and really solidified Xbox as a contender for the next 20 years. Yep, that, that pretty much sums <laughs> it up. And we had LAN parties, uh, like Xbox LAN parties. I didn't... Yeah. I didn't do that with any other console. No. I never brought my console to anyone else's uh-huh. house until I had an Xbox with Halo. Yep. Now I'm bringing my Xbox with four controllers, eight friends. Who's coming? 
I've got a copy. You got a copy. I got a console. You got controllers. Let's go. Oh God, and so that's like we spent night after night, overnight stays, energy drinks, pizza rolls, hot dogs from Sheets. I can't tell you how many countless nights have been spent uh-huh. I mean, staying this up game, late playing Halo. This game inspired yep. an entire genre of entertainment in the form of machinima through a well-known web series called Red vs. Blue. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it spawned a freaking whole new form of entertainment using a game engine to tell stories, make online videos uh, that, that had never really been done before Halo. So, yeah, mm-hmm. crazy. So, crazy good game. Uh, that's all that needs to be said. Yep. It's so good. That's it. I want to play Halo. Let's go play Halo. We're going to stop now and we're going to get together and play Halo. <laughs> now wait till I get a Series X so we can play it in 4K. Okay, fair. <laughs> All right, next on this game is a game actually I've never, I've never heard of, so you can tell me about Ico. You never heard of Ico? No, I have not. Ico is the, the, the first game in the series that led to um, Shadow of the Colossus oh, and then sweet. Last Guardian. Cool. They're all in the same series. Nice. Yeah, and they're made by the same developer, um, which is, I should know this. It's, um, it's Team Ico. Yeah, it's, oh, Team Ico. Named after the oh, game, nice. Ico. Gotcha. Yeah. Team Ico. So it was that it's basically a giant escort quest. Okay. But at the time it was like very cinematic. It was very artsy, so to speak, kind of like journey. I don't really know how else to say that. Mm-hmm. Like really good score, really good art direction, weird, unguided, no gooey kind of gameplay. You don't really know what's going on. That's why it's under the action adventure like genre, because you just have to explore. You just have to jump on things and like interact with objects in the environment and figure out what to do as you guide a, a character through a treacherous world. It's dungeon and gates and puzzles and i never got very far into this game because i don't do well without the hand holding uh-huh. <laughs> in my modern time of not being able to play games for very long and have limited time to play games and so like i jumped in on the hd remake or the hd port for ps3 and i played it for a couple hours and i was like i don't really know how to advance i don't want to watch a bunch of videos to show me so i moved on but it is you know, groundbreaking for this kind of genre. And it did lead to shadows of the Colossus and the last guardian that we know and love. Yeah, Not only that, I'm looking at its legacy here in, in the Wikipedia page, both AG Aonuma and Hideo Kojima cited as influencing the visual appearance of their games, legend of Zelda twilight princess and uh, metal gear solid three snake eater, respectively. Not only that film, film director Guillermo del Toro cited both Ico and Shadow Colossus as masterpieces and part of his directorial influence. So, yeah, super arts, clearly super artsy game that had ripple effects on the artistic aspirations of various auteurs in in and out of the industry. So, yeah. (laughs) Mm hmm. Yeah. Miyazaki from the Soul series talked about it as an influence, too. That's crazy. Yeah. So many people. It was inspiration for uncharted three so yeah this game whatever this game was never played it never heard of it personally never this game never crossed my path but clearly has had ripple effects into lots of games that i love so and lots of develop uh, lots of develop developers and artistic folks that i have a lot of respect for so yep nice all right go yeah play it. I should <laughs> all right next is ikuraga another game i've never played obviously <laughs> <laughs> this is a shoot 'em up. It's Japanese, of uh, course. It was made. What developer made Treasure? this? Treasure. I've never, I've heard, never of heard of them either. <laughs> but a Japanese video game developer in Tokyo. It's known for action platform shoot 'em up games. The company was founded in '92 by former Konami employees. Uh, I have dabbled in this game. I believe there was a GameCube port. Yep, it's there on the list mm-hmm. of platforms. Uh, crazy action pack. What you would experience in like Near Automata at the beginning. Yeah, with all of the little like, like the bubbles balls, everywhere yep. and lasers and that's yeah. That's what it immediately made um, me think of when I saw the screenshot. Yeah, so it's the shoot 'em up genre. You know, top down view, yep. shooting an airplane, moving around, free range, all the different power ups and weapons and crazy evasive maneuvers and the hectic screen. It it's like that. <laughs> But really, really well done. Yeah. Well, obviously, why it's on this list. Cool. So there you go. Yep. All right. Next is a game I do recognize. Max Payne. Oh, my gosh. 2001 is nuts. I know, right? Re- developed by Remedy, who would go on to make games that we've talked about, like uh, uh, Control and Quantum Break and uh, Alan Wake. Alan yep. Wake. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Max Payne was published by Gathering of Developers, which is not a... Yeah, it must have been something before Rockstar. It was acquired, it eventually on... acquired by Take-Two Interactive, so, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. what, yeah, interesting. Yeah. For some reason, I've always thought of this as a Rockstar game, but it's definitely no, not. No. Um, it's got the same But vibe. I played it on PlayStation 2, and on this list, it's listed under PC, so I understand why. Introduced bullet time mechanics mm-hmm. for the first time in a third-person shooter. 
Yep. Um, so over the shoulder view, ridiculously dark, grungy world told with cinematics that were in a graphic novel between I was missions. Say, highly stylized, and, looks like a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Sin City was very much a film way to me. Like Sin City is the film version of the feel and tone yeah. and storytelling yeah, medium of what Max Payne did. Obviously very different stories and different things happening, but just like that style, if you want something to relate it to. But I mean, this was a super dark, like your family was murdered, including your baby and you had to go chase them down. But the guy was the, he was an ex cop detective uh, who was going crazy and had his own mental issues. And so like you would play levels that were all black and you'd follow like a trail with a screaming baby in the background. He was like addicted to drugs, painkillers, which were also the mechanic for your health. To restore health, you take more painkillers. It's so like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's the game. Really, really, really freaking good game. And with the third person shooting mechanics, with the bullet time, and using something like his addiction to painkillers as a health boost, all of those kind of things you have never seen before in video games. So they kind of moved that genre forward and had to marry the story with gameplay mechanics and tell a really good story with art direction and stylized way. It just engaged and immersed you in that story and in that way. Really, really solid shooter. Have you played it? I have not, and I want to because I've become a Remedy fan in, in later in my later years, but I never got around. The the game the game triggered my in two thousand one as an eleven year old, the game triggered my cheesy radar, which again oh, now really? in at, at the time I had no taste, so like <laughs> screw 11 year old dan like the when what you're describing and what i've what i you know in hindsight looking at it i'm like oh this looks like a game that would be totally up the alley of 30 year old dan but not 11 <laughs> year old penguin mm. <laughs> so weirdly like before remedy got into the the paranormal stuff that control and alan wake and mm-hmm. stuff had this was very much grounded in reality except for the mental levels <laughs> that you had to go through with max Payne. those were the crazy yeah. ones uh, that were all supernatural esque, but you knew that they were, you were taking place in the head of Max Payne, not in the yeah, reality. Of course, of course. And, yeah, yeah, cool. Yep. All right. Next on the list is Metal Gear Solid Two: Sons of Liberty. This is the first Metal Gear Solid game that I ever played and interacted with, and I both loved it and hated it. I loved it for what it was, for what it was. I hated it because I did not have the patience as an eleven year old for stealth action games. <laughs> <laughs> oh nice yeah you were a little, a little too young a little too young for the for the to get really i mean this game again i loved what i wanted it to be which is this cool military shooter game with a crazy story about mech robots and all kinds of crazy stuff and then i but the stealth mechanics ruined stealth games for me for the next like 10 years <laughs> I, I hated stealth <laughs> games so because funny. this game frustrated me so much so uh yeah and I, I hated stealth games like Splinter Cell, but I adored Metal Gear Solid 1. I adored Metal Gear Solid 1 so much that I played it through multiple times. And then this game was announced and shown off. And there was a demo disc in Zone of yes, the Enders, another Konami published that. game. Mm-hmm. And I wanted Zone of the Enders more for that demo disc <laughs> than the actual game itself. <laughs> and like, luckily, Zone of the Enders was amazing. And I played through that like crazy. Yeah. But I would devoured the demo disc for Metal Gear Solid 2. But what I hated about this game was the demo disc showed off a Solid Snake level, the very introduction, Mm -hmm. where you're on a tanker, a a boat, and then afterward you switch to Raiden, and you play as Raiden on an oil rig the entire time. And I didn't like that. I wanted to play as Snake, not Raiden. And it drove me nuts. But then after experiencing Metal Gear Solid 2 many, many times, I come to fall in love with all of the gameplay mechanics of this game and how they moved the genre from Metal Gear Solid 1 to Metal Gear Solid 2, adding things like first-person view, uh, stuffing bodies in lockers, interacting with your environment in like unique ways, uh, and adding more items to change the, the way you could look and assess the situation and view your enemies. And it was more than just chaff grenades and stuff. It was like, uh, it was a myriad of different mechanics in there. The boss fights were super unique, with each of them having some crazy supernatural power, like the first one with Psycho Mantis. One of the enemies was like a vampire and you had to have mm-hmm. a certain item to like survive that fight. Uh, and the other one was on rollerblades and like he was sitting on a bomb, but you didn't know it. So you had to find this bomb countdown timer, super stressful, but it was actually under the boss. You had to go, but there's no way to know that. So they did the same kind of things. The Metal Gear Solid one did where you had to look on the back of the case. It was, they broke the fourth wall and said, Oh, the, the radio frequency is on the case. <laughs> they kind of continued that vibe into Metal Gear Solid two and they enhanced it more. In fact, it was so good in its in its um, gameplay mechanics and how they interacted with the environment and stuff that they remade Metal Gear Solid 1 with Silicon Knights 
Twin Snakes came out on the GameCube and they took the engine from Metal Gear Solid 2 and put all of Metal Gear Solid 1's story in it. So you had this stuff like first person views and being able to to do all nice. that. Just an amazing game. And this is the other game that goes with Final Fantasy X that these two titles are the epitome of what PlayStation 2 was as a console and what it brought to the gaming industry. So I can't I can't praise Metal Gear Solid 2 <laughs> enough. It might be my favorite Metal Gear Solid game. And you guys already know because of my DLC picks that I always choose Solid Snake because I love <laughs> yes. Metal Gear Solid a yes. lot. Nice. I was going to say, I was just briefly reading through it to see what the legacy and all that was. And I noticed I stumbled across this little funny tidbit, which I think is pretty funny because since you had been talking about uh, Raiden, it says here that according to Kojima, he came up with the idea of Raiden to appeal to female players after overhearing female debuggers working on the first Metal Gear Solid remark that the game was not appealing to them. <laughs> oh, interesting. Wow, that's, uh, that's funny. Really funny. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Next on the list is a game called Rez. It is a shoot 'em up game. I know nothing about it. So it says it combines yep. mechanics from the music game genre and rail shooters like Panzer Dragoon. Was this the game that uh was this the game that was like trying to demonstrate what it was like to have synesthesia or was that something else? I don't remember. I have no idea what you're talking about. There was a game on the Dreamcast that was meant game. to simulate what it was like to have synesthesia, which is a, a, a mental condition where people can like see sounds, I think, as color. So when they hear a sound or music spell? or something like that, they see they actually see color. And there was a game that was meant to like demonstrate that, but I don't know if this is that or not. I'm, I'm oh yeah, it is. Can it was. It was aiming this? to create a sense of synesthesia. So okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what it is. Synest. 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 Synesthesia. Like the same root word as synthesize. Yes. Got it. Okay. Huh. Yeah. I don't. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> I know okay. nothing. That's the only thing game, I know. I guess. That's the only thing I know. But I mean, That's the funny. fact that it's trying to do that. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for games that are trying to like give me an experience that I can't have. So like, send you oh, a sacrifice. Yeah. Trying to simulate and demonstrate what it's like to live with uh, schizophrenia. This this game doing the same for synesthesia, which is something I'll never experience in my life because I don't have that condition. And that's kind of cool. So I imagine it was probably a really awesome experience. I imagine as an 11 year old, I probably would have hated it. So <laughs> right. probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Last two games. Let's knock them out. Oh, for the record, this show, this game was on the Dreamcast and the PlayStation. It was made by Sega. Um, but mm-hmm. cool. All right. Next game on the list. Silent Hill 2 survival horror game by Konami. Konami on the PlayStation 2. This game is freaking terrifying. <laughs> yep <laughs> like what this, else the first game i talked about the story of infamous where termite was looking walking into a room and the locker was shaking and i was terrified so much that i, was, I can't open this locker i can't do this anymore grab my brother grabbed the controller and opened the locker and a cat jumped out me out and ran off the screen it was completely trolled and i'll never live that down but silent hill 2 brought you know at the time it was playstation 2 xbox graphics the fidelity of what you would see in like Metal Gear Solid 2 or Halo or Grand Theft Auto, much more fully realized game, still ridiculously scary, but it was even more scary because of the new graphics. And so I didn't play this more than like a little bit. I don't have a copy, unfortunately, and they're expensive now. But yeah, it's more more Silent Hill, more survival horror, yeah, horror, more I, survival horror. I did not like horror games at the time, horror anything at the time. So I, I avoided this game like the plague. But even then... I still had interactions with it and just remember just remember just the, the game's ability to create fear using its environment was unparalleled at the time. I mean, and ironically, yep. they came up with the idea of the fog because of the draw distance. The PS2 couldn't handle what they wanted to do. So they're like, why don't we add like fog to it so that people can't see? And just, yeah, that was that was that choice was like based on like using they turned a liability into advantage they turned a limitation took a limitation and turned it into an advantage in a way that just yep. yeah is iconic to this day so anything else about silent hill mm-hmm. just it i want to play it i want a copy on my shelf and i want to experience it <laughs> on ps2 as it was released and it won't be, it won't be that scary now because the graphics are dated but yeah it's it's something i i wish i had more um in my life yeah all right, I'm surprised that this one showed up on this list and not its predecessor, but we right. are now at the end of the 2001, and we'll close out with Super Smash Bros. Melee. Oh, man. I guess I can understand it in regards to just, like, its impact and legacy. I mean, as recently as a news episode that we filmed, like, last week, there was there was um 
controversy surrounding the 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 big house, right? Like the whole the, the the Smash Bros tournament and how it got shut down by Nintendo, and that was Melee. It was for is because of Melee. This game yep. is well, a, it was yeah, it was um netcode modified version of it but yeah it's yeah, melee is so groundbreaking and so the people are foundational still playing it to this day and it's got a following yep, to this day exactly. even when there's like three other entries that have come out since i mean i love i love the first mm-hmm. smash bros and it was incredible i probably did play more of melee though i just i mean i i was scrolling back up i was like certainly we talked about their first smash bros but no this is the first smash bros game that shows up on this list but if anyone is going to show up on the list of best games of all time it should be smash bros or sorry it should be melee and this game <laughs> made me so hyped for the GameCube because I remember when the GameCube was announced in 2001 the internet was very was very new and trailers being showed off on the internet was a new thing uh-huh. and so with the advent of the GameCube I remember seeing trailers of Luigi's Mansion Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader and this game was also shown off obviously the first two were launch titles Smash Bros was in like the launch window it was pretty close after and my, I adored the original Smash Bros on 64 and the N64 version of Smash Bros the frame rate's probably like in the twenties yeah, all the time, yeah. and it's very it's clunky, clunky. But but it's all we knew, right? It's all we knew, so it was normal. And then Smash Bros. Melee was full sixty frames per second at four eighty resolution, which is a higher resolution than sixty four yeah. and a higher frame rate, and it looked so much like it was a more than a generational leap forward. Right. And then the it character, was again an early in, in a lot of ways. It was an early foundational title for esports. Would become what would become esports to this day and it was because it was a game that highly valued precision and the you know the knowledge the knowledge of the depths of the game systems is a value you know again it rewarded that if you if you knew how to play the game and you were precise you would yeah so that's that's what esports basically is right so yeah yeah this game this game is foundational to a lot of things and yeah oh man yeah okay all right melee but this game wasn't like developed to be an esports title it was just developed to be a couch co-op like successor to the n64 game we all know and love and yeah so it, that's what's weird like the, it's so good the community took it and ran with yeah. it right that's mm-hmm. what i'm trying to say yeah. it's it wasn't developed for that purpose it was and like yeah it yeah here's this really achieved, good game they yeah. achieved something incredible so was, yes and that was uh, sakurai sakurai was the one who made it right like he was still making it at that time yep masahiro sakurai so so good, so freaking good, incredible game. Do yourself a favor and go look at the E3 2001 announcement trailer, and just try to if you if you saw that, it's so hype. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And I mean, they, they added more characters. <laughs> yeah. That was the big thing at the time. Is it really started this tradition of like secret characters that you discovered over time? They can't do yep. that these days anymore, obviously. But uh, still, the idea of like getting hyped around who's going to be in Smash Bowser. Oh Sorry, my yeah. gosh, Bowser! I mean, when you know, again, this game introduced an entire uh, game franchise to the West in the form of fire emblem with Marth and Roy. Uh, it was just, yep. yeah, so many big, I mean, you, Mewtwo wasn't he an unlockable character as well. Just like, yep. yeah, it's, yep. yeah. The idea of uh young link. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. So good. So Zelda, Zelda was playable for the first time in any game. I yep. think in smash Bros. melee. Peach. Just, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so good. So, all right. Well, <laughs> I'll talk about Smash Melee. <laughs> I want to play Smash Melee right now. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so that's it. That's that. Uh, uh, predictably, we only got through two years, 2000, 2001. Uh, hopefully, we'll pick up with the with the we'll maybe at least plow through the rest of the mid 2000s or, or early 2000s in uh in the next episode that we do on this. But this rounds us out for the year. Do you have any impressions on these two years? Overall trends and impressions of why are there so many good games that came out what is it about this these two years that made it so that we had to talk about them for an entire episode in regards to (laughs) games that show up on this list okay so we saw the advent of the 3d worlds of playstation sega saturn n64 and then migrated to the dreamcast kind of at the late the late 90s pc came in and destroyed consoles they dominated 98 99 and 2000 they we just talked about that earlier it's just like pc game after pc game after pc game with counter-strike and diablo and Baldur's gate and everquest and planetscape all this stuff was just destroying everything then we got the playstation 2 the xbox and the gamecube the next generation of consoles popped in at the end of i'm sorry in 2001 all those came out and we we just saw consoles have once again a sort of mini breaking experiences yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, uh, they came back. They brought it back. Uh, the downfall of the Dreamcast also kind of happened at the same time uh, as PS2 was eating everyone's lunch. 
Um, Nintendo was killing it on the GameCube. Halo came out on Xbox. So it was just like the focus just shifted it to some degree, like back onto the consoles, like those PlayStation, even comparing it to today, we, we just finished the PlayStation four generation. And we're going to talk about next week on the episode about the year and how awesome the PlayStation experiences were look at 2001 and it's just PlayStation two, PlayStation two, PlayStation two, PlayStation two, it's like six, seven, seven titles. Like it destroyed 2001, which was a launch year for that console. And we saw all the different genres get hit RPGs, open world sandboxes, racing games, Metal Gear Solid 2 being a stealth kind of action adventure ish game with a crazy story. I was say, there's no um, single genre that really dominates either of these two years. Like you, even when right. you see like action game, action game, action game, if you actually look at those action games, they're all so different. You've got action sandbox in Grand Theft Auto. You've got action uh, adventure game in the form of Legend of Zelda, Majora's Masks, kind of RPG elements. You've got the big RPG in Diablo 2. You've got a first person RPG in Deus Ex. Like, they're so different kinds of experiences. So, yeah, it's just, there's no, it's just, a, it, like I said, a renaissance. It's just an explosion in these two years. And I mean, even in the two predecessor, too, 1999, 1998, like, even though they were dominated by PC, just the, the types of games that are getting, that were getting made in those four, these four years, the innovation that's happening with the, you know, new hardware, new 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 types of things are just being imagined and these these you know this la- the last episode we did back in the summer and then these two years just really like these these four years are just foundational to the experiences we're still having to this day like th- these yep. many of these titles have franchise have have spawned franchises that exist to this day or or inspired games that are being made to this day like these games are yeah this crazy year or crazy years yeah and we saw like the advent of two major esports genres happening, and that's in Halo and Smash Bros. Melee. So that's that happened yeah. <laughs> in the early onset of 2001. Um, land parties and the multiplayer aspect of what can be done in the home, you know, branching away from arcades, more branching off, like not even utilizing the internet because at the time Xbox Live hadn't really taken mm-hmm. off yet. So this was all couch co op. It was getting people in each other's houses. Uh, the multiplayer revolution. Is kind of happening here. Yep, it was the begging one time. The, the, yeah, these games were begging the question: Who's the best at this? But all right, that is all yep. the time. We are way over time with what we normally do. So let's go ahead and we want to hear your feedback on these two years: 2000, 2001. If you want to check the list, is there anything that's missing from this list based on your experiences? Anything you think should be on there? Do you agree? Rogue Leader. That these games are <laughs> Star- Rogue Squadron Two is not on this list. Yeah, are you? Are you agree that some of the games should be on here, shouldn't be on here? We want to hear those thoughts and more. Termite will tell you where you can give us that feedback. You can find us at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our website that has links to everything, all of our podcasting platforms, so you can get this show on any platform you want with our RSS feed. If we're not on any platform that you want us to be, let us know, and we'll put ourselves there. We'll make sure we're there for you because we want you to hear us talk and be involved in our community and interact with us. The ways you can actually get us to respond to you are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Reddit, and we have a Discord server as well. And you can catch us on twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash every Monday night and Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern where we have our new show and our weekly gameplay live stream respectively on that platform. And those videos do go up to YouTube for your video on demand consumption as you see. And you can also leave comments on our YouTube videos too. So there's a myriad of ways for you to interact with us. We're on everything except TikTok. Yeah, we're not TikTok. So that's where we are. Just, yeah, I'm on China to take my data. <laughs> that's okay all right sure <laughs> all right then next week we will be doing our new year's tradition it will be the new year 2021 we'll do our new year uh, we will do our typical tradition of going over the year of 2020 in review so look forward to that next week and we'll see you then see you next week <laughs>